Peter Burris, and this is Wikibon's Action Item. We're joined here in the studio by David Floyer. Hi, David. Hi there. And remote, we've got Jim Kabilis. Hi, Jim. Hi, everybody. Now, uh, Jim, you probably can't see this, but uh, for those who are watching, when we do see the broad set, notice that David Floyer's got his Game of Thrones coffee cup with us. Uh, now, that has nothing to do with the topic. David and Jim, we're going to be talking about this challenge that businesses have, that enterprises have, as they think about making practical use of AI. Uh, the presumption for many years was that we were going to move all the data up into the, into the cloud in a central location, and all workloads were going to be run there. As we've gained experience, it's very clear that we're actually going to see a greater distribution of function, uh, partly in response to a greater distribution of data. But what does that tell about the relationship between AI, AI workloads, storage, and hybrid cloud. David, why don't you give us a little clue as to where we're going to go from here? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is separate out the two types of workload. There's the development of the AI solution, the inference code, et cetera, the dealing with all of the data required for that. And then there is the execution of that code, uh, which is the inference code itself. And the two are very different in characteristics. Um, for the development, you've got a lot of data. It's very likely to be data bound. And as storage is a very important component of that, uh, as well as compute and, and GPUs. Sure. Uh, at the, for the inference, that's much more compute bound. Uh, again, compute neural networks, GPUs, uh, are very, very relevant to that portion. Storage is much more ephemeral in the sense that the data will come in and you will need to execute on it, um, but that data will be part of the set, the compute will be part of that sensor, and you will want uh, uh, the, the storage to be actually in the, the DIM itself or non-volatile DIM right up as part of the processing, and you'll want to share that data only locally in real time through some sort of mesh computing. So very different compute requirements, storage requirements, and architectural requirements. Yeah, let's come back to that notion of the different storage types in a second, but Jim, uh, David described how the workloads are going to play out. Give us a sense of what the pipelines are going to look like, because that's what people are building right now is the pipelines for actually executing these workloads. How are they differ? How do they differ in the different locations? Yeah, so it's the entire DevOps pipeline for data science, data analytics, AI in other words. And so what you're looking at here is all the, the processes from uh, discovering and ingesting the data to transforming and preparing and correcting it, cleansing it, to modeling and training the AI models, to serving them out for inferencing along the lines of what David's describing. So there's different types of AI models that one builds from different data to do different types of inferencing. And each of these different uh, pipelines uh, it might be highly, often is highly specific to a particular use case. You know, AI for robotics, that's a very different use case from AI for natural language processing embedded, for example, in an e-commerce uh, portal environment. So what you're looking at here is different pipelines that all have, all share a common sort of flow of activities and phases. And you need data scientists to, to build and test, train and evaluate and then serve out the various models to the consuming end devices or applications. So David, uh, we've got uh, uh, 50 or so years of computing where the primary role of storage was to persist a transaction and the data associated with that tra transaction that has occurred. And that's you know disk and then even all the way out to tape if we're talking about archive. Flash changes that equation. AI absolutely, absolutely demands a different way of thinking. Yes. Here we're not talking about persisting the data, we're talking about delivering the data really fast, mm. as you said, sometimes in very ephemeral. Uh, and so it requires a different set of technologies. What are some of the limitations that historically, or that, that storage has been putting on some of these workloads, and how are we breaching those limitations to make them possible? Well, uh, if we take only 10 years ago, the start of the big data was Hadoop. And that was spreading the data over very cheap disks, uh, hard disks, with the compute there. And you spread that data and you did it all in parallel on very cheap nodes. So uh, that was the initial, but that uh, is a very 
uh, expensive way of doing it now because you're tying the data to that set of nodes. They're all connected together. So a more modern way of doing it is to use Flash to use uh, multiple copies of that data, but logical copies or snapshots of that flash, and to be able to apply as many processes, nodes, as, you, as is appropriate for that particular workload. And that is a far more efficient and faster way of processing that, or getting throughput through that sort of workload. And, and it really does make a difference of tenfold in terms of elapsed time and ability to get through that. And the overall cost is very similar. So that's true in the, in the inference, uh, that's true in the inferencing, or I'm sorry, in, in the modeling. In the modeling, What about yes. in the inferencing side of things? Well, the, the inferencing side is, is again, very different um, because you are dealing with the data coming in from the sensors or coming in from other sensors and smart sensors. So what you want to do there is process that data with the inference code as quickly as you can in real time, most of the time in real time. So when you're doing that, you're holding the, the current data actually in memory or maybe in what's called uh, uh, non-volatile DIM, NV DIMs, which gives you a larger amount but you pr almost certainly don't have the time to go and store that data. Right. And you certainly don't want to store it if you can avoid it because it is a large amount of data and you know, if, if I open my- It's limited derivative use. Exactly. Yeah. So you want to get all the, or quickly get all the value out of that data, uh, compact it right down uh, using whatever techniques you can and then take just the, uh, results of that inference up to other ones. Now, at the beginning of the cycle, you may need more, but at the end of the cycle, you'll need very little. So Jim, the AI world has built algorithms over many, many, many years, uh, many of which still persist today, but uh, they were building these algorithms with the idea that they were going to use kind of slower <laughs> technologies. How is the AI world rethinking algorithms, architectures, pipelines, use cases, as a consequence of this, these new storage capabilities that David's describing. Well, yeah, well, AI has become uh, widely distributed in terms of its architecture increasingly, and it often increasingly is running over containerized Kubernetes orchestrated fabrics. Um, and a lot of this is going on in the area of, 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 of training of models and distributing pieces of those models out to various nodes within an edge architecture. It may not be edge in the Internet of Things sense, but widely distributed, highly parallel environments uh, as a way of speeding up the training um, and speeding up the modeling and really speeding up the evaluation of many models running in parallel in an approach called ensemble modeling be able to converge on a, on a predictive solution uh, more rapidly. Um, and so that's, you know, and that's very much what David's describing is that that's leveraging the fact that memory um, is far faster than, than uh, any storage technology we have out there. And so being able to distribute pieces of the overall modeling and training and even data prep uh, workloads uh, is able to speed up the uh, deployment of highly optimized, uh, highly sophisticated AI models for the cutting edge, uh, uh, you know, challenges that we face, like the Event Horizon Telescope, for example, uh, that we're all aware of, you know, when they um, when they uh, were able to uh, essentially make a visualization of a black hole that relied on a form of highly distributed AI um, called grid computing, uh, for example. I mean, the challenges like that demand a highly distributed. Uh, memory-centric, uh, uh, orchestrated uh, approach to, to, to tackling. So, so uh, you, you're essentially moving the code to the data as opposed to moving all of the data all the way up to the, the uh, one central point. Well, so if we think about that notion of moving code to the data, and I started off by suggesting that in many respects what the cloud is, it's an architecture approach to how you distribute your workloads. Uh, as opposed to an approach to centralizing everything in some public cloud. I think increasingly, Correct. application mm -hmm. architects and IT organizations and s service providers are all seeing things in that way. This is a way of more broadly yes. distributing workloads. Now, as we think about, we've talked a little bit about the relationship between storage 
and, uh, and, and, and AI workloads, but we don't want to leave anyone with the impression that we're at a device level. We're really talking about a network of data Absolutely. that has to be associated with a network mm -hmm. of storage. Yes. Now that suggests a different way of thinking about yeah. how we th about data and data administration and storage. We're not thinking about devices, we're really trying to move that conversation up into data services. Yes. What kind of data services are especially crucial to uh, supporting some of these distributed AI workloads? Yes. So there is the standard ones that you, you need for all uh, data, which is uh, uh, the uh, uh, backup and safety and uh, Encryption, security, control, primary storage allocation—all all of that, stuff. all of that—you need that in place. But uh, on top of that, you need other things as well because you need to understand the the mesh, the distri distributed hybrid cloud that you have, and you need to know what the capabilities are of each of those nodes. You need to know the latencies between each of those well, nodes. Let me stop you here for a second. When you say you need to know. Do you mean I as an individual need to know, or the it system needs to it know? It needs to be known, and, and it's, it's too complex, far right. too complex for an individual ever to solve problems like this. So it needs, in fact, its, its own little AI uh, environment to be able to optimize and, and, and check that the, uh, the SLAs for that particular inference coding can be achieved. Uh, in, in the way that it's set up. So it sounds like... In it's, a mesh com it's a mesh type of computing. Yeah, so yeah. it sounds like one of, the, one of the first use cases for AI, practical commercial use cases, will be AI within the data plane itself Absolutely. because the AI workloads are going to drive such a com complex model and utilization of data yeah. that if you don't have that, the whole thing will probably just fold in on itself. Jim, how would you characterize this relationship between AI inside the system and how should people think about that and is that really going to be a practical near-term commercial application that folks should be paying attention to? Well, yeah, well look in the, in the cloud native world, what we need and what we're increasingly seeing out there um, are solutions, tools, really data planes that are able to associate a distributed storage infrastructure of a very hybridized nature in terms of disk and flash and so forth with a highly distributed containerized application environment. So uh, for example, just last week at Red Hat, I, I met with the, the folks from Robin Systems and they, they're one of the solution providers providing those capabilities to associate, like I said, the st uh, storage cloud with the containerized essentially application clouds or cloud applications that are out there. Um, you know, what we need there, like you've indicated, are the ability to use AI to continue to look for patterns of, uh, look for performance issues and, uh, and bottlenecks and, and so forth, and to, to drive the ongoing placement of data on storage nodes and servers within uh, clusters and so forth, as a way of making sure that storage resources are always used efficiently, that SLAs, as David indicated, are always uh, observed in an automated fashion right. as the data placement and workload placement decisions are being made. And so ultimately that the AI itself, whatever it's doing, like you know, re recognizing faces or, 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 or recognizing human language, is able to do it as efficiently and really as cheaply as possible. All right, so if we, let, me, let me summarize what we got this far. We've got that there is a relationship between storage and AI, that the workload suggests that we're going to have centralized modeling, large volumes of data, we're going to have distributed inferencing, smaller volumes of data, more complex compute. Flash is crucial, the mesh is crucial, uh, and increasingly because of the distributed nature of these applications, there's going to have to be very specific and specialized AI in the infrastructure, in that mesh itself, to administer a lot of these data resources. Absolutely. So, but we, we want to be careful here, right, David? We, we don't want to suggest that we have, just, just as the notion of everything goes into a centralized cloud under a central administrative effort, we also don't want to suggest this, this notion that there's this broad, uh, heterogeneous, uh, common, democratized, every service available everywhere, Let's bring hybrid cloud into this. Right. How will hybrid cloud 
uh, ultimately evolve to ensure that we get common services where we need them and know where we don't have common services so that we can factor those constraints. So, so it's, it's, it's useful to think about the hybrid cloud from the point of view of the development, um, which will be fairly normal type of computing and be in large, really large centers, and the edges themselves, which will be what we call autonomous clouds. Those are the ones at the edge which need to be self uh, self-sufficient. So if you have an autonomous car, you can't guarantee that you will have communication to it. Uh, and most, uh, a lot of I.O., uh, sorry, a lot of I.O.T. is in distant places, which again, on ships or, or distant places where you can't guarantee. So they have to be able to run much more by themselves. So that's one important characteristic. So that that autonomous one needs to be self-sufficient itself and have within it all the capabilities of, of running that particular code and then passing up data when it, when it when now you, can. You gave, you, gave, uh, you gave examples where it's physically required to do that, but there's also OT examples, exactly. operational technology, yes. where you need to have that air gap to ensure that absolutely. you can't, bad guys can't and get to your in. data. Yes, absolutely, I mean, if you think about a boat, uh, a ship, it, it has multiple very clear air gaps and, the, and the, a nuclear power station has a total air gap around it. You, you must have those sort of air right. gaps. Right. So it, it's, a, it's a different architecture uh, for different uses for, for different areas. Um, but of course, data is going to come up from those, uh, those uh, autonomous upwards, but it will be a very small amount of the data that's actually been processed, the data, and, and there'll be requests down to those autonomous uh, uh, clouds for additional processing of one sort or another. So they, they still will be a, 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 a discussion, a, a communication between them to ensure that the, the final outcome, the business outcome is, is met. All right, so I'm going to do uh, ask each of you guys to give me a quick prediction. David, I'm going to ask you about storage, and then Jim, I'm going to ask you about AI in light of David's prediction about storage. So, David, as we think about where these AI workloads seem to be going, uh, how is storage technology going to evolve to make AI applications easier to deal with, easier to run, cheaper to run, more secure? Well, uh, th the fundamental move is towards a larger amounts of flash, and the, the new thing is that larger amounts of non-volatile uh, uh, dim the, uh, the memory in the computer itself. Those are going to get much, much bigger. Those are going to help with the execution of these real-time applications. And there's going to be high-speed communication between uh, uh, short distances between the different nodes in this mesh architecture. So that's a, uh, a, on the inference side, there's a big change happening in that space. On the uh, development side, the storage will move towards sharing data. Uh, so having, having a, a copy of the data which is available to everybody, uh, and that data will be distributed. So ha sharing that data, having that data distributed, uh, will then enable the sorts of ways of using that data which will will retain context, which is incredibly important, and avoid the cost and the loss of value because of the time taken of moving that data from A to B. All right, so to summarize, we've got uh, a new level in the storage hierarchy that's puts between flash and memory to really accelerate things, and then secondly, we've got this notion that uh, increasingly we have to provide a, a, uh, a, a way of handling time and context so that we sustain fidelity, especially in more real-time applications. Yeah. Jim, given that this is where storage is going to go, what does that say about AI? Hmm. What it says about AI is that first of all, uh, we're talking about, like David said, meshes of meshes. Every edge node is increasingly becoming a mesh in its own right with disparate uh, uh, CPUs or GPUs and whatever, doing different inferencing on each device. But every one of these, like, like a smart car, uh, you know, will have plenty of Im embedded storage to persist a lot of data locally that may need to be kept locally for lots of very good reasons, like a black box in case of an accident, but also in terms of 
e-discovery uh, of the right of the data and the models that might have led up to an accident that might have caused fatalities and whatnot. So when we look at what AI, where AI is going, is AI is going into the mesh of mesh, meshes of meshes, where there's AI running in, in each of the nodes within the meshes, and the meshes themselves will operate as autonomous you know, decisioning nodes within a broader environment. Now, in terms of the context, the context increasingly that is surrounds all of the AI within these distributed architectures will be in the form of graphs. And graphs are something that's distinct from the statistical algorithms that we've built AI on. We're talking about knowledge graphs, we're talking about social graphs, we're talking about behavioral graphs and so forth. So graph technology is just getting going. And for example, Microsoft recently had built, uh, they made a big uh, continued push into threading graphics, contextual graph technology into everything they do. So that's where I see AI going. It's up from statistical models to graph models as the broader metadata framework for binding everything together. Excellent, all right guys, so uh, I'm gonna, Jim, I think another topic another time might be the mesh mess, uh, <laughs> but we won't do that now. All right, let's summarize very quickly. Uh, we've talked about how the relationship between AI storage and hybrid cloud is going to evolve. Number one, AI workloads are at least differentiated by where we handle modeling, Large amounts of data still need a lot of compute, but we're really focused on large amounts of data and moving that data around very, very quickly, but therefore proximate to where the workload resides. Great, great application for clouds, large, public, as well as private. On the other side, where the inferencing work is done, that's going to be very compute bound, smaller data volumes, but very, very fast data. A lot of flash everywhere. The second thing we observed is that these new AI applications are going to be used and applied in a lot of different domains, both within human interaction, as well as real-time domains within IoT, et cetera, but that as we evolve, we're going to see a greater relationship between the nature of the workload and the class of the storage, and that is going to be a crucial feature for storage administrators and storage vendors over the next few years is to ensure that that specialization is yeah. reflected uh, in what's known, or in what's needed. Now, the last point that we'll make very quickly is that as we look forward, the whole concept of hybrid cloud where we can have greater predictability into the nature of the data-oriented services that are available for different workloads is going to be really, really important. We're not going to have all data services common in all places, but we do want to make sure that we can assure whether it's a container-based application or some other structure, that we can assure that the data that is required will be there in the context form and metadata uh, structures that are required. Ultimately, as we look forward, we see new classes of storage evolving that bring uh, data even closer to the compute side, uh, and we see new data models emerging, such as graph models, that are a better overall reflection of how this distributed data is going to evolve within hybrid cloud environments. David Floyer, Jim Kabilis, Wikibon Analyst, I'm Peter Burris. Once again, this has been Action Item.